And now, right to your hosts of Down the Garden Path, Joanne Shaw and Matthew Dressing. Welcome, everyone, to this episode of Down the Garden Path, where we discuss down-to-earth tips and advice for your plants, gardens, and landscapes. As landscape designers and gardeners, we think it is important and possible to have great gardens that are low maintenance, and we want to help you make it happen. I am Joanne Shaw, landscape designer and owner of Down to Earth Landscape Design. I have been designing beautiful gardens and landscapes for homeowners east of Toronto for over a decade. With me across Zoom is my co-host, Matthew Dressing. Welcome, Matthew. Welcome, Joanne. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I am Matthew Dressing, horticulturist and landscape designer and owner of Natural Affinity Garden Design. Natural Affinity is a landscape design and garden maintenance firm servicing Toronto and the Eastern GTA. Joanne and I enjoy hosting Down the Garden Path each week, bringing you interesting, relevant, and helpful topics to help you achieve a great garden. We learn right along with you from each other, from our research, and from the guests that join us here on the show. As always, we welcome your questions via social media, email, or phone call. That's right. And we want to thank you, as always, everybody who's tuning in right now for joining us on the live version of Down the Garden Path. Um, And let you know if there's any new listeners, let you know that you can always check out past shows of Down the Garden Path on your favorite podcast app, because this show will then be um, um, later this week uploaded as a podcast. So we've got uh, lots of content there over the years for you. And while you're there, don't forget to subscribe so that you'll be notified of new content. And of course, please like and share or leave us a comment. So we look forward to uh, hearing from you or visiting us. I know like you like to remind everybody, right, to visit us on our Facebook page, Down the Garden Path Podcast Facebook page or uh, Down the Garden Path Podcast Instagram page. Oh, can't hear you. Oh, I moved you on Zoom and I was saying, yes, that's right, exactly. Yeah. And I accidentally <laughs> moved, uh, muted you. So yes, exactly. That's exactly what I like to say. So yeah, um, yeah, definitely. And um, yeah, I totally lost me there for a second. Lost me there, yes. <laughs> so anyway, so like us and uh, Matt's back and uh, stuff. So what's happening? So we're here. Uh, it's an, It's an, been another hot week. Oh my goodness. And is this the last, this is the last show of July? Oh my. The last show of July. Can you believe it's already like, it's supposed to be August next week. And they're saying, just talking about like hot and the weather. I heard today that uh, uh, August is supposed to be even hotter than July. Really? Because do you, so uh, listeners don't, anybody who's been listening for a while realize that you and I freakishly share the same birthday. Many yes. hard, but anyway, and I've always, it's always been a sad, like one, I've never liked having a summer birthday. I honestly haven't. Friends were always away. I've never liked it. And I've always found that it was the signal of cooling down summer ending was my birthday. Yeah. So I, I, like, even now as an adult in her fifties, I'm like, oh, it's good. Summer's coming to an end. Isn't that sad? So it's <laughs> hilarious that you say, no, no, it's going to still be hot. So yay for global warming. No, I'm yeah. I'm just <laughs> that's kidding. the only time kidding. listeners you'll hear her say that okay. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ever. I know, but it's just so funny. Yeah. So uh-huh. I, you know, that really is a memory. Did you like having I know we're totally off topic. Everybody start writing in your questions now, but quickly, Matt, did exactly. you like having a summer birthday? Uh, you know what I did? did I did. Um, yeah, I just liked being in the summer. I didn't have to worry about going to school. And I had a lot of friends on my uh, in my neighborhood. So yeah. sometimes we would and we wouldn't get together or I was up at the cottage. So I, I loved it. I had oh, no that's good. Funny, eh? Same birthday, <laughs> two takes. Ha. Exactly. Different, a whole different podcast. <clears throat> but, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah anyway so what's happening watering 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 at the garden center oh you know it yeah it is just burning hot out there um yeah in the garden center we just can't keep up with the watering so we've got like three four five people doing it at the same time on top of the irrigation system that runs basically all night long uh different zones for different lengths of times but yeah it is it is a hot one out there it really is hot um and the yeah. rain, we just got some, a few cloud bursts a couple times today, and it seemed yeah. to make it hotter. 
It did, yeah. We've got all that humidity now just coming off all that warm, warm cement. Um, yeah, so it didn't really help us much. And I, people were looking at me because we had that rain and I was out there today watering. We had that rain and we ran inside and then it had just rained, it was still cloudy. And I was out there with the hose still watering and it's like, well, that's so quick. It never waters anything. Like, yeah, you got to exactly. keep going. So exactly. never so, trust the rain really. To yeah. Do and are people, how you work this weekend or are people looking for? Yeah. You know what? A lot of people are starting to look for those hydrangeas, those dwarf shrubs. Um, they're starting to think about some fall color. Um, butterfly bush and rose of Sharon's. Some of them, not so much the rose of Sharon's, but things like the butterfly bush or the caryopteris. Uh, it's just a, they like the color for them, uh, but they were hit like some of the hydrangeas by the May snow that we had. So they were like put back by like two, three, four weeks. So things like that, we're just starting to receive. Yeah. Um, and we have our own farm. So we've yeah. had to protect them and grow them on. So yeah. there's yeah, still some sure. stuff to come out, but yeah, mm -hmm. it's just so just dwarf some long color, uh, low Even You dwarf. say that though, even though like my quick fires, that's why I love them is because of their early blooming in June, but really they just started mid July. So the same thing, yeah. like they're two weeks behind. They are doing amazing yet Bobo is just budding. So, mm -hmm. you know, quick fire is still ahead of all the others, but they're all about two weeks behind, oddly enough. And I don't know, I mean, limelight is getting buds on it, but it's probably still gonna be now the beginning of August where it's normally like June, July, mid July is limelight's blooming, that kind of thing. So. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Yeah. You don't realize that you think because of the heat that plants would have caught up, but really, it's no. not. Mother Nature doesn't always work the way we think it's going to work. Yeah, it was so hot. We and I think we talked about this a few weeks ago. It was. It's been so hot at the garden center. Things have just stopped. Like they're yes. just stopped in their tracks. They're not and leafing in my anymore. Garden too. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and they're just the buds are frozen. I think maybe even last week we were saying that. Yeah. So, yeah, it's weird how it works. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so very much. So my garden's doing okay. I mean, I haven't watered. I'm happy to see the rain. I, I mean, we've been watering our vegetables and stuff in the and my containers, but I haven't. Uh, I kind of given up on watering the grass, and uh, <laughs> and we've had that spots of rain have been holding it to a certain point. So uh, so yeah, I haven't been watering anymore. But I'm thinking I should get the tree bag out and do some deep watering for my trees. But uh, yeah, yeah. So aside from that everything's yeah. good and so we're talking another day like our last day on shrubs it's our last shrubs that's right our last episode of shrubs so anybody who's missed it we all month we've talked about shrubs um you're good at you go ahead and read that i'm so yeah. like i'm like uh butting in or what am i i'm whatever you have it written better than i will say it so go there for you it. go I'll read the little segue bit. Okay, you segue. <laughs> yeah, so it's the last uh, last thing we've been talking about, all about deciduous and evergreen shrubs. So we've talked about, uh, we're about to talk about uh, some native shrubs, some native ours. We've talked about how to prune uh, and some new and noteworthy deciduous and evergreen shrubs. And then, yeah, so tonight we're going to wrap up our month along all of those shrubs uh, and perhaps prefacing next month's first uh, topic, next week's topic, uh, with a look at native ours. Uh, so we'll talk about what is a native R and how they come about them. Uh, but if you want to join the conversation, like Joanne was saying about uh, the shrubs, uh, or if you have any other questions, you can always write us here at instudio101 at gmail.com. And you can reach us anytime here at instudio101 at gmail.com. Gary is amazing and uh, looks after the mail for us and always keeps us in touch off the air when you guys write in. But you can also reach us anytime. You can find uh, me at Matthew at naturalaffinitydesigns.ca and you can find Joanne at Joanne at down the number two earth.ca. So that's yes. right. And just before we jump in, um, I just wanted to just talking about writing in and listeners. Um, right at the end of the show, we got uh, Linda. Linda, you wrote in and said, hi, another fantastic radio show tonight. Uh, I learned a lot. Thank you for all of the advice. Please stay healthy. Uh, and Linda was from St. Augustine, Florida. So thank you, Linda. I'm sorry we didn't get to your email or I didn't get your email as we wrapped up last night. But thanks again for tuning in and we hope you enjoyed tonight's episode too. That's right. Thank you very much, Linda. Excellent. 
So native R, like that's kind of a cool term. Yeah, so native R. So we know what a native is, right? So a native is just, you know, a plant that is native to a region or an area. Uh, and there's many benefits to our natives. But we have also um, cultivars. So we've cultivated certain, um, we've, we've created and we cultivate certain ver um, cultivars of these native plants. So they've kind of combined the two. So it's native R. So they just kind of put the N on cultivar uh, or split the word in half and it's native R. So it's basically a plant that its parents are native to your area and there are cultivars, culture, a variety that has occurred that we cultivate and we sell for. So yeah, so um, yeah, so that's that's what native R's are. So we talk about native plants and the benefic benefits of attracting, you know, beneficial insects. Uh, and the adapt, uh, their adaptability to our native gardens and our zones and regions and geography. Uh, but there are a lot of really cool plants that we like to talk about or we see out in our garden centers that are actually cultivars our, or native ours of our native species. So we thought we would kind of, next week we're going to talk about, spoiler alert, uh, we're going to talk about native trees. So as we kick off our month all about trees uh, and upright evergreens. So I thought, you know, tonight we're going to talk about some native R, so some shrubs that are native and um, yeah, that are created and that maybe we don't know that are actually native that we could be planting to enhance our gardens, but still get what we wanted of our shrubs. Excellent, excellent. I did want to give a shout out to, um, I meant to tell you, talk to you about this before the show, but, um, you know, people say, well, because there's a lot of people who say natives are invasive, or they're messy, or they get big, like there's issues with native plants. Um, so why, you know, but there is another reason in that there are a lot of, um, so I remember hearing, and everybody can Google him, his name is Doug Talamy, T-A-L-L-A-M-Y. Um, and there's a lot of insects or birds that only feed like our single source birds. Like, so sometimes like it's not just about what looks good or that you're putting berries for the birds kind of thing, but maybe that bird only eats off of that tree. And if we're not replenishing the natural habitat of those trees, then that bird, then we're going to lose that bird. Um, so he had a, so when he did the talk, oh my goodness, he talked so fast and there were so many cases, but he had a lot of cases of different birds or different insects that only um, depended on one type of tree, native tree. And with, with, with urbanization and lots of other reasons, a lot of the fires in the, in the areas that have fire, have had fires, you know, the West Coast, um, Alberta, that type of thing. So that is something to think about that it's not it's um, not just about keeping that bird that tree alive or keep or planting that you know quote unquote for the birds for let's say food but also sometimes for the its very existence yeah no that's an, an excellent point and i don't think we kind of i know we don't definitely yeah like i mean and i know where i'm just right? scratching the surface on that bringing that up but that's just something you know, uh, and then hopefully Matt and I would I would love to do a deeper dive on his book and and, and that type of thing, um, and some of the podcasts he's been on. But he spoke at Landscape Ontario this past year, and so I learned a lot. But it was you know in a quick period of time. So I we can do another deep dive on that. But I just wanted to give everybody another spin on why it's important to choose a native tree like a red oak because of all the different insects and birds that depend, like red oak is one of those that, you know, right? A lot depend on a red oak. So when I, you're picking trees for your yard, it isn't always just about the prettiest tree necessarily. Not that a red oak isn't pretty. Oh no, I mean, it's a beautiful tree. Right, right. Yeah. So You're right. I think I read somewhere the red oaks themselves house and support over 500 different species of insects so and birds and yeah. and other wildlife that like what that's crazy yeah yeah for sure so maybe we can uh i can get some time to do a deeper dive on that because it was mostly trees and so maybe we can find some time next month to kind of focus on some of those recommended things that he recommends to, to plant but uh but as far as shrubs go i know you know there's some that i just happen to love and it's just and i put them in a lot of designs in a lot of yards and it just so happens that they're native you know but uh, yeah, so why don't you start off telling us a little bit um, more about them? Yeah. Or 
Okay. <laughs> um, God, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off on the end. No, no, it's okay. Um, yeah. So we kind of touched on, you know, the native R's that produce, you know, a native population, the variety occurs. Sometimes there's some crossbreeding and hybridization. Uh, and then we find these these varieties that we decide to cultivate because of their their favoring conditions. And so like you were saying as well, some people think natives and they think, oh, it's going to be so invasive or it's going to do this. Messy right? and big and yeah, all of that. Exactly. And so what these native ours, these native cultivars do, um, you know, they take some of that and they take some of the ones that are more clump forming or they're not invasive or they're a smaller habit or that sort of thing. And I'm going to totally forget her name, but much like Doug's talk about the species that are supported by these native um, trees and shrubs and the, the food chain. I want to say her name is Amy or Emily and I'll try to find it. I didn't write it down. I don't know why. Um, but one of the big talks about these native ours are whether or not, again, supporting the wildlife that they, the native species does. So do they have the same pollen and nectar resources mm. or do they produce they produce maybe produce a berry but are those berries still edible by all the species that would be mm. eating that berry and maybe as nutritious that type of thing and then exactly are they as nutritious what other pollinators are they supporting so there are some substantial differences between the cultivars and the native are some sustain and uh so some attract and sustain the same populations as their native parents some do not attract as many pollinators and sustain. Uh, some have the same quality or quantity of pollen and nectar resources. Um, there's a lot of different factors. So there's a lot of research, a lot like I think what Doug has been doing. Um, and I believe her name, yeah, Amy or Emily, I think she's in Pennsylvania and she's doing a major study uh, on all of this. So it's very interesting to read and I'll find that for us too so you guys can take a quick look. The main tip for most of her research um, that has come out is avoid the native ours whose leaf color is different than its parent. Oh, okay. Yeah. So for and let's just pick one off the top of our head, like something like a service berry. Okay. Right? For the most part, I don't know of any cultivars or native ours of service berries that have a different, they all have green leaves. Mm -hmm. right they will have fall color and that that's not what the tip's saying um so the leaf color is different if it has a natural fall color that's fine <clears throat> but if it has suddenly you have like for example a purple leaf sand chair or purple service leaf berry service berry yeah right the the stay to the green service berry cultivars because they have been shown so far to hold more uh, of those pollen resources and that support that the service berry group will do Okay. So that was the big tip from, from taking it away is, is stick to the actual native leaf color. When you really start to play with the leaf color, um, it changes the genetics enough that it plays too big into other factors. So, okay. So that's just some, some tips. Um, and then we're going to talk about a whole bunch of cool plants that hopefully you guys maybe have or have not heard of. Mm -hmm. um, but we do have a few questions popping in. So just before we start, um ken is writing in he says hello love your show a question for you what are the best smelling plants for your yard um i live in laredo texas i'm zone 9a thank you um we are not in in zone um uh, uh, nine there ken so um a few that just kind of just a quick list um gardenias there's some gardenia First one, there. pop into my head too right yeah exactly like, oh yeah gardenia uh definitely some gardenias um there's some japanese mock oranges with creamy white flowers beautiful orange blossom fragrance um there's some ground covers like himalayan sweet box uh there's like a golden crane hydrangea one of the earlier blooming hydrangeas it's not hardy for joanne and i it's more of like a zone six seven uh through ten slash eleven uh, there's some, actually some viburnums and jasmines that uh, you could take a look at, some different elderberries. And here we're talking about some like the elderberry, for example, or the viburnum. These are also North American native shrubs that we're going to talk about um, 
that you could be planting that might support some of that local uh, native insect and wildlife diversity to really enrich and keep your garden going. Um, looking to see what zone uh, Rus Russian sage is. Mm. Um, I'm in trying because that has a fragrant um, foliage, really. Yep. So I'm just looking for that. I'm not seeing it. Um, I find mo the, the straight uh, Porovskia atropicifolia, if I can say that, <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. is four to nine. Oh, OK. Um, OK. And then so they'll go up into the nines. Um, and I think there's a couple of tens as well. But OK. All right. Yeah. So that's a good, good choice. Okay. So hopefully, Ken, that answers your question. Um, but, you know, write us in again. And again, if you're just joining us in studio 101 at gmail.com, if we have any questions about shrubs as we wrap up our shrub month. Um, another one writes in, Brett, uh, just saying hi from Arlington, Texas. Hope you're getting through the dry climate as we are. Uh, is there any general fertilizer that we should mix with water for our houseplants? Uh, anything to add general purpose mixture? Thank you. Um, thanks for turning in, Brett. Um, yes, we are fighting the heat. However, I'm sure you have it worse than we do. <laughs> so uh, uh, stay cool and hydrated there. Uh, but yeah, you could use just something. I love Schultz's 101510. Pardon me, not a plug for them, but a, a personal favorite of mine. Just easy to use. Um, it's, it's just kind of liquid. Nice yeah, I think a liquid one is nice. Yeah, and I just say it's, it's yeah. really it's just a liquid concentrate with a little eyedropper, seven drops per liter, and they also have a full line for orchids and all sorts of different yeah, house plants. Yeah, specific. Well. So, mm -hmm. cactus is African violets. So, yeah, yeah, uh, that's what I would I would recommend. Just something indoor that yeah. So take a okay. look there. Perfect. And hopefully that answers your question, Brett. And then just to, before we go, Mike had just written in, uh, hello folks, great show as always. My question to you tonight, are raised beds a good idea over conventional beds? Mm -hmm. um, they definitely have their benefits. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe he can write in and say whether that he means flower or, or vegetable. Um, but I would agree in both cases, you know, if, if it's a budget thing usually, so raised beds, you know, tend to be better in the sense that you can get more, you know what I mean? You're coming up, right? So you're then usually putting in new soil. Yeah. You can control um, the soil. It's better drain. Um, yeah, weed definitely. control is a little bit better. It's been better on your back. Yes. <laughs> you know, there's a few different things. Um, if you're talking veggies, then I think it's definitely helps to keep the mm. critters out, right? If they're a little, if it's a little bit raised and above, of, you know, on, on, I was on stilts, but like on like <laughs> stuff, you know what I mean? Then you're not having to worry about, you could still screen it depending on where you are, but, um, you know, or fence it, you know, I've seen some even the rays that still have a little bit of fence chicken wire around it type of thing. But uh, yeah, so there's lots of advantages to raised beds. I know we talked um, with, uh, oh. Uh, that's exactly what I was Tara. Talking. We talked with Thank Tara you. about her book, Raised Bed Revolution and uh, front garden, Raised Beds in the Front Garden. So definitely look for Mike for look for that book. She definitely highlights all the benefits of raised gardens and that there's a lot of different ways to build raised gardens. She had some really cool and eclectic ones uh, as well. So, uh, so yeah, so I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mike. So some native ours. So we mentioned in Ken's question, uh, some of the fragrant zone nine plants. Uh, one of them was viburnums. So there are like 17 different species of viburnums that are native to North America. Um, but a lot of them are grown for uh, their early white flowering um, flowers in the spring um, or midsummer. Pardon me as I'm choking on something. Uh, in early spring, um, their upright habit, but also they have really great berries and fall color. Mm. One of the ones that caught my eye, um, it was Viburnum cassianoides, uh, is the species, and the cultivar is little, little as in L I L, ditty. Um, and it's a great blooming one, it's about one to two feet tall and wide, great for a foreground soft white flat heads of, uh, of beautiful white flowers that really almost cover a, it reminds me about like a spring bobo the way that bobo just gets so dense mm -hmm. when she's she's mature 
um, but nice lanceolate, like almost like a medium olive green smooth color, and then blazing crazy red fall color. Um, so just a really nice, easygoing kind mm -hmm. of shrub. Um, do you do you use any viburnums or? I do. I um. I, I it's funny because I have one that I don't know the name of that I put two of them in my garden, and it's so nice. They're early bloomers. They've stayed very dwarf, um. So I really like that. Um. Yeah. So I do. Um. And I um. Summer snowflake is a viburnum, yeah. right? So I definitely like. But no berries on summer snowflake. No. Right. She gives you beautiful, like she blooms forever though. Yeah, um, yeah. she hasn't liked the heat this year or else I haven't watered her enough. So she's been a little bit less uh, blooming than usual. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, but, uh, and I and I wish I knew the name. I'm gonna have to get you, send you a picture of, uh, or do some research. I mean, even, even in the summer when it's finished blooming, it's got a really nice leaves and it's really just, it's no maintenance whatsoever. And it stayed a nice size and it's a nice background plant. Uh, and then I know as fall, we approach fall, then the leaves will go red. So, and I don't know one, it's sh shade tolerant too, because I have one that gets more sun than the other one. And so they're different sizes, but they're both still pretty healthy, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of, that's always a nice thing. And are you finding that the one that's in more shade is still blooming as nicely as, as the sun one? Or, or it's still blooming, but maybe a little bit more sporadic. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. That's what I thought, but. Yeah, the that one's Viburnum placatum, and she's native to like China, Korea, Japan. She's an Asian, okay, Asian Viburnum, but okay, so not a native, not a native, but that's yeah. okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and so then there are also some uh, different Viburnums, the um, Spice Baby, uh, and then Sugar and Spice Viburnums as well. Um, and where did my thing go on those? These guys are a little bit, a little bit bigger. Spice Baby is about three and a half to five feet by the same. Uh, Spice Girl is about six to seven. Uh, but again, beautiful um, uh, white and somewhat fragrant flowers. She's a Carlesii version. Um, hardy from zone four to eight. They're mounding and upright. Uh, and then just like beautiful, fantastic uh, fall color. So excellent. excellent. There's a lot of cool North American native cultivar, native ours that are coming out. Yeah. Trying to switch the term, yeah. native yeah. ours that are coming out. And I do want to highlight the question I asked you before we started was: oh, yeah. uh, often when we're talking about plants, we're talking about zones, like what what zone um, are they appropriate for? But the thing about the natives is, and the native ours is that they it's more by, based on geography. So sometimes, right. so someone who's listening in Chicago. Um, you know, Illinois, Mi Minnesota, Michigan, you know, that type of thing. These plants also are native to you. Like it's not like, a, you know, but here we are in Ontario, Canada, but just because it's a native plant to us, it's also a native, like it's kind of got the whole geography, right? And, yeah. Um, which is great. Exactly. Exactly. You can still use something that we're using up in Ontario mm -hmm. down in North Carolina or uh, further west, right? Um, yes. So there's lots of different regions. So yeah. those zones cover a big geography to take a cover. Yeah. Now you have chokeberry on here. And is there a difference between chokeberry and choke cherry? Yes. Okay. Um, yes. So chokeberry. So tell me a little bit about chokeberry. Yeah. Um, there was, um, so the, the chokeberries are, are the erroneous. And the two newer ones that jump out at me um, were the new um, black chokeberry, the, the low scape hedger and the um, other taller one. So they're, sorry, I'm just, I moved my little page here. No problem. Uh, so low scape hedger. Um, so she's about um, 36, so like three to four, maybe five feet tall um, okay. by about two to three feet wide. And um, they come out beautiful little button clusters of white flowers. They can get some of the smaller black berries and then the beautiful red uh, fall color as well. Uh, okay. So they've got a beautiful glossy foliage. I just kind of thought it was just something neat that you could use as almost like a small hedge alternative. There's the low scape mounding one. 
uh, which is a little smaller, which is almost closer to a two by two, three by three. And then there's the hedger one that gets a little taller, uh, which again, with that nice, bright, glossy green foliage and that fantastic fall color. But again, it's going to shade, like what are they? Yeah, yeah, sorry. No, nope, good question. They are more part, uh, part sun to full sun okay. as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But then again, you're going to have those flowers um, that is going to, again, just the flowers that are going to support all those insects and the berries that are going to come later and um, support those birds. those um, birds and things like that. Yeah. And okay. the other animals, but they're heat tolerant. Um, there's no real deadheading that you need to do. They're salt tolerant. Um, and uh, again, another big North American native uh, that we could be planting all over the place. So just some great versatility there. Okay. Um, and button bush sounds interesting. Yeah. So button bush was. Uh, oh, let me bring that one up because that one is kind of like the. You can hear your typing. Um, oh, can you really? Oh, yeah. that's not good. I have to. Yeah, I kind of closed that one. Um, Button bush was a newer one to me that I didn't really know um, a whole lot about. Um, uh, but it, so it's it's Cephalanthus occidentalis. So it's okay. a North American native. Has white flowers with red fruit. Um, there's a number of different sizes, anywhere from uh, two by two, three by three, to about four by four. Uh, hardies through zone four through 10. And these guys attract bees and butterflies and hummingbirds. And they have a nice, very like soft bottle brush like flower. Sometimes they're a little bit longer, like a fothergill. Uh, okay. But most of them tend to be a little bit more rounded with spikes on them. They are deciduous. Um, they will take um, the full sun to part sun. Um, and yeah, um, yeah, the bloom on new wood, and then they'll bloom pretty much all summer long. So I like that one too. Just Ooh, it, that's a good feature. For yeah, because sure. it had a nicer, longer, longer bloom period as yeah. well. Yeah. yeah, and I I googled it, and it came up um, in uh, uh, the Bee Culture magazine. So they must be uh, something that the bees love, and they are really unusual looking, aren't they? Yeah, they are. Flower. So they're a fun kind of a different eye catching. Yeah. Flower, if you think it was okay. well. The other thing I like to know just about to it is um, they tend to be fairly uh, water tolerant as well. So if you've got something that's a little bit more boggy or watery, you've got uh, poor drainage, oh. you need a little bit of a wet spot, she's going to give you a little bit uh, of height and size and some nice color in that spot cool. as well. Excellent. Excellent. That's always a good one. One of the ones I know everybody likes to talk about, we were talking about it a little bit um, before too, um, hydrangeas. That's right. Right. Uh, the Annabelle, the Arborescent series, the smooth leaf. People one. don't realize, eh, that that's native. That's it. And so are the uh, oak leaf hydrangeas. I'm shocked well. at that. And yeah. that's, yes, exactly. I thought they were a little further, like much further south, more like South America or like a different spot i didn't realize okay. they were so close to us but they're yeah. native to like the north and the eastern um part of of uh north america as well right as the states now Canada. would those be um definitely native ours like the ones that we, you're selling at the garden center and that i'm putting in gardens like would they be more sorry hybridized or yeah modified, they'll be a, for lack of a yeah there will be hybrids that have been created to create those native ours yeah. okay um for sure so we were talking about um I, there's like a, the pink ones the new invincible the whites um the invincible spirits so there's whites and there's pinks and they're they're now just more than just our native our our native uh, annabelle hydrangea that's that four to six to by four to six wide there's some nice uh, i think we talked about many movet uh last week with that kind of pinky purple flower that's kind of smaller, that two by two, three by three range. So there's a great deal of um, variation now within that arborescence family, including that incredible hydrangea. It is um, a cultivar of um, arborescence of, of that Annabelle hydrangea. So, and I believe that one was by some crossbreeding that occurred. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, I have been neglecting 
the email. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so we have some listener questions. Well, we do have some listener questions. Um, as I just see the little thing. And there is quite an extensive list here. So obviously we can't chat about every single plant, but we'll talk about our favorites, right? Yeah. After we ask, uh, answer some questions. That's right. Uh, so spring writes in, happy evening. What causes shrub to lose their leaves on the, at the bottom half? Um, I have boxwoods. Thank you. Um, yeah, that could be a, a number of different things, Spring. Um, just not being able to see them. It could be an insect or a pest. Uh, it could be a disease of some sort that is causing them to, um, to be dropped. They could, things could be overshaded. Boxwoods are usually pretty easy growing. Um, it's usually when they get too, like they're heavily pruned or they're very V-shaped, you can get them where they, you can start to see those stems that are, are, are exposed in the hedges. Um, but nothing else really jumps out to me for, especially for boxwoods. Mm -hmm. um, Unless it's snow, like if it's in an area where I think there's like yeah. maybe a lot of snow and ice, uh, then, you know, the bottom like never recovers after the winter kind of thing. Like if you're shoveling the snow and piling it there, you know, obviously you, you might not be in a, in a cold climate like we are so that might not be the case but that's another well, thing that, to think of yeah exactly and that was going to be my next question like have is there been like any salt damage is there like been piling something on there like snow have you broken it um you know do you have kids or dogs or someone that's damaged the stems but yeah perfect no that was what i was gonna say next cool so hopefully that that helps um spring but if you have a picture or any other um details maybe that we're missing or something you see on it uh if you want to write back we'd be happy to yeah, continue yeah. to see what's going on uh but thank you for writing in um we've got a few more okay um but one of our native ours um one of the native ours of a uh, native ilex um a holly comes to mind there's the um strong box and gem box evergreen holly that are a lot of people with the boxwood blights and now the boxwood moth uh, people are turning to the these hollies uh, to basically like replace the boxwood because they're evergreen and they have that really small leaf and again just like boxwood they're going to be able to tolerate tolerate a little bit more of a partial of the full sun than they do the full shade like the boxwood but they've got that again that prunable very dense growing evergreen uh, nice soft small green leaf so um, take a look for those yeah I think they're Ilex glabra and then they're um, the strong box and the gem box if you're a little further the strong box um, is the male and the gem box is the female but the gem box is really if you're up here in the GTA zone 5 uh, zone 4 where Joanne and I are the gem box we're finding still is very kind of finicky for our winters. So the burying box version really isn't quite hardy yet. Uh, and so it's mostly the male that you'll see in more of the northern regions. Uh, okay. But you can get the male and the female. And the male tends to grow a little bit bigger than the female for those who can uh, capture and grow both. Excellent. Yeah. So that just kind of spring just kind of had that spring to mind for me. So. Um, Peter, Peter writes in, love you guys. Thank you, Peter. Uh, for next year, what are the best drought resistant grasses to grow? Uh, if we get a hot spell like this in Toronto again, um, just speaking again, native. Is, yeah. But does he mean lawn grass or? Oh, great question. Yes. So yes. Peter, are you thinking Peter, like you lawn? You might need to clarify that. Yeah. All right. Yes. Yeah. So or are you thinking like ornamental grasses? Mm-hmm. Yeah, because most of the ornamental grasses are pretty tolerant, and that's what I was kind that's of. That's what thinking. makes me think he's he's thinking maybe lawn questions. Yeah. Lawn question. Yeah. So Peter, can you clarify that for us? <laughs> yes, and then we'll dive right into there. Yeah. All right. So we'll wait on Peter for a second. Um, Cindy has a big question. Ooh, big uh, one. Hello. Yes, <laughs> she says hello. My husband and I are sitting here listening to your radio show, and we thought. We really do not know a lot about our favorite gardening hosts. So here are some questions. Oh, wow, Cindy. <laughs> Cindy, this might just take us a little off, but let's- um, Okay, go for it. We'll throw it. Uh, so there's a few questions. You want me to, Joanne, do you want me to read just all the questions and then go back? Or do you want me to just like one by one? I don't know. 
what do you think? Do yeah, you see them? To, How many questions like, are there? Uh, let me see. One, two, three, four, five, six, about seven. Oh my gosh. Okay. Uh, and then. Um, we might have to email you the responses, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so how about really quickly, uh, favorite flower? Oh, Ooh, oh my, that's not quick. Go. <laughs> okay. Next question. Favorite tree. Uh, well, favorite flower, hydrangea. Um, favorite tree. Ooh, um, my tricolor beach. Ooh, that's a good one too. Mm -hmm. I was thinking, yeah, tricolor beach. That's a great one. Um, I like also the paper bark maple. Mm -hmm slower growing but I love that copper exfoliating bark and that almost like grape like ivy leaf it's really cool okay um or uh petticoat maple that's one of my newer favorites too Ooh, that's nice. uh, it's green on top and then velvet purple underneath it's super neat uh favorite shrub wow hydrangea hydrangea clearly um you know what I am probably yeah either a hydrangea a potentilla or one of the like the yeah you every time I say potentilla I know um, I'm not not a fan I love okay. it uh or, or something like um sorry the like the the native hollies the deciduous hollies mm. I love I love those guys uh, what's your biggest pet peeve about uh, that you see other gardeners doing and it's for me it's watering the leaves at night it drives me bonkers uh yeah red well i would say red mulch um oh, uh, and also just people not getting a, a proper advice like or, you know just yeah. I, I just wish i think people you know ask an expert and and get a plan i i think people think it's you know would rather take the the plant material that they're getting for free that might not is is really i know is going to disappoint them as opposed to just asking for proper advice. So it just breaks my heart to see people giving, planting stuff that I know is not good. That one, so. I agree with you yeah. there. And then just from the garden center side of things, they have this big, beautiful landscape that they love. And then they have those like one and a half, two foot gardens. And then they yes. just come oh, in and they- scale, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my yeah. God. Yeah, like, yeah, not planting the gardens big. And, oh yeah, this is a big, that's a whole show, Cindy. That's a whole show. <laughs> of our <laughs> pet peeves. We could turn this, Cindy's questions into a whole show. Oh, uh, that's a good idea. Yeah. Uh, what's your favorite time of year uh, to work in the garden? Uh, fall, because I don't have time in the spring or the summer. <laughs> <laughs> True. Uh, I like the spring. I love it. Everything coming yeah. out and just that warm, air but I love the fall because of all the colors and knowing you could just see the cycle the leaves falling and the insects going to sleep and the seeds being born um I love that too okay uh, yeah uh grass stone or architecture in your yard grass or stone I'm not too sure um I have very little grass so I've mostly garden and garden architecture. garden and walk walkway yeah I would stone and garden myself too and just yeah uh, and then favorite color of plants? Purple and white, I guess. Yeah. Purple and white. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, that's a tough one. My favorite color is green, period. Um, I like the, the different textures of greens and yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Silver, Foliage. So, so Excellent. And okay, back to our beers, enjoying the show. Uh, Cindy's in Seattle, Washington. Oh, thank you, Cindy. <laughs> so thank, you. thank you. That was fun. That was fun. <laughs> Quick fire, rapid fire. Yeah. Uh, when he writes in, hello, listen to your show when I can. Thanks for the great information this year. I used quite a bit of it. I live in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, fantastic radio show. Thank you. You guys rock Winnie. Uh, oh, thank, thank you, you. for writing in. Thanks for listening in when you can. We love it. We love to hear where you guys are from. Uh, like Ray says, hello from Regina, Saskatchewan. Love the show tonight. Uh, how can you tell if your indoor plants are getting too much water do the leaves turn brown not sure thank you um yeah they'll start to wilt um because overwatering and underwatering have identical or mirror image um, symptoms you can also tend to see yeah they'll kind of turn brown or like the edges and the margins will start to brown first and or go black as they kind of just rot out and suffocate you can sometimes smell it too or if mm, you try smell to smell the soil yeah smell the soil you can smell that something's just a little not soily or a little off there or also if you pull on some of the leaves or the stems you might find that they just come up easy or the plant really isn't rooted in the pot and it's kind of wiggling at its crown and it's just kind of sitting there yeah so 
Uh, Ray, as best you can, if you like a pot but it has no drainage, you know, put it in a plastic pot and insert it there. Uh, and just make sure it has, has good drainage and uh, just know who you've got um, because everybody, all the plants like people like different conditions. So, yeah. Excellent. And thank you for your question. So where were we? We were with native. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think yeah. I, we got native ours and I know we can't cover everything on our list, but I no. think there's a lot of things. I think people think that they're native plants um, are, you know, something they've never heard of, but there are a lot of common, like on our list, I, you know, you've mentioned a few, we mentioned, um, holly and we mentioned uh hydrangea like the uh, uh, annabelle and the oak leaf but things like nine bark and potentilla uh, <laughs> are not my favorite but you know cedar as far as evergreens go um summer sweet you know there's a whole selection of summer sweet that you can get at the garden center and um and elderberry you know yeah. i think a lot of people don't realize so so yeah so i think there's a lot of stuff that you're already buying um, that may already be in your garden that is actually native. Um, or if you're wanting to something that's like a sure thing, then it's a great way to uh, look for, you know, looking for uh, for them. Yes, so it'll be easier to find because they're, you know, like nine bark and potentilla, you know what I mean? Whereas some of the some of the like button bush might be harder to find. Um, doesn't mean you shouldn't seek it out if that's something oh. that's going to work for you. If it's a wet area and you want flowers all summer, and you've got a big space, then that's a great shrub. Uh, but uh, yeah, but it's kind of cool to know that you could get an elderberry too, which would also get quite big and give you the flowers and the fruit. Uh, yeah. yeah. And then again, take a look at like the elderberries, like our native North American one has a green leaf. And we often use things like laced up or black tower uh which has now has a purple leaf so it still has the white flowers um will bury but you tend to be a little bit more when it's more mature than than it is younger um, but again just watching that that change of color kind of changes the chemistry of it um so even though you know you have a big beautiful uh laced up elderberry um you know it may not have the same resources in your garden for those native that native wildlife and insect life okay yeah. okay yeah. Excellent. Um, and cedars. I think cedars get a tough, bad rap. I think we should spend a few minutes talking about cedars. Thank um, you. you know, I think they get, yeah, they get a tough rap, right? And, and it, they're kind of a necessity because people hate looking at their fences or they need privacy above the fences and they want something in the winter. Um, and often I know myself um, here in, in the GTA, you know, greater Toronto area, you can often get them, you know, for 20 bucks at your big mm. box store. And, and so I try to explain to people that that's fine. That's, you know, that's a quick, cheap hedge, but that those aren't the natives, that those are actually grown on the West coast. Often they're grown in soil that isn't our, our native soil and that winter, you know, so you often see the hedges, you know, where they plant six and then every year they're replacing a different two. Right. Yeah. And that, um, you know, they look very similar to our, native cedars, but we've got native and like Eastern uh, cedars, you know, Thuya occidentalis. Um, then there's like the black cedar, the white cedar. I mean, those are all like native to North, like to our zone. Again, mm. I, I'm, I'm not sure of the geography of that, Matt, but there, uh, you know, you could probably speak to that a little bit. Yeah, your, your Thuya placata, so that's your Western cedars. They're all um, Northwestern um, and the West Coast and the Northern uh, area of the continent. So you're okay. way over on the West Coast. Uh, yeah, BC, so BC, Alberta. Yeah, uh, Washington. Seattle, Washington, you know, that area. For right. Sure. And then your Eastern Cedar, by the name, you know, it's the Northeastern, but also the Central side. So the Eastern side of the Rockies moving to the East Coast and up North, uh, you know, through Pennsylvania, New York, uh, Quebec, Ontario, uh, out into the, the East, mm -hmm. the Maritimes. Yeah. And you see them, like, if you think about it, they're growing in the wild on their own, looking mm -hmm. green, looking happy. Nobody's watering them. Nobody's pruning them. You know, they're still lush and they are, you know, give privacy, like some of those, you know, older homes with the really established, nice, big, you know, um, hedge between neighbors. And it's those ones that we're buying in the, in the you know, that are trimmed narrow in, in a pot and that we're wanting to be that. And, and it's just not the case. Um, and again, there's insects and birds and 
things that re really depend on the native cedars. Yeah, exactly. The you cones know? and the shelter mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. thickness. For sure. And they often are, they often do cost more. They are grown here. They're, they, they aren't fast growing necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, so definitely our local growers are spending the time to cultivate them and to grow them. And they are more, unfortunately, than the ones that grow in the West Coast that are shipped out here that really, uh, really struggle. Like there are some people that'll say, oh, mine grew fine. Great. But I think my, my experience has been that uh, you know, it's, it's, they're tough. They're tough going. Um, mm. You know, if you want one or two, you probably can win the battle, but if you're looking for a hedge of six or more, you know, it really is challenging. Yeah. And, uh, and I think that thinking about what the birds and the bees and, and the insects want, um, you know, then it's, it's much better to go with the Eastern uh, white cedar, the black cedar, uh, that type of thing. That's right. Don't, don't you agree? Yeah, yeah. We even have people coming into the garden center, and the first question is, "Are these Ontario grown?" Because I don't mm. want them from BC because I know oh, they're not going to be tough. So it's again, yeah, going to like education, yeah, education, that's and you know, grow local, and mm -hmm. um, yeah, for sure. Yeah, and, have a better luck at it. Yeah, I think cedars also get a bad rap, just as like a total sidebar. Um, mosquitoes. Mosquitoes. Yes. Do you get that question too? All, all I love the, the cedar, but it attacks attracts mosquitoes. mosquitoes. No, no. Uh, they're thick, they're dense. The the native eastern cedar can sit in water. That's why it's that swamp cedar. Mm -hmm. But it's dark and it's sheltered and it's thick. And that's where mosquitoes like. It's damp. It's dark. It's thick. There's moisture nearby. They're smart. They know to be there. So if you have moisture and a dark shady spot mosquitoes are going to find their way into your shrubs no matter what shrub it is that's right um, but in your typical suburban yard yeah. that's not the case you know you need to water your cedars and you need to take care of them they're yeah. not sitting in water they're not attracting the mosquitoes so it's one of those things i i say this thing too like the mosquitoes are attracted to water and cedars like water but not everybody these days in the suburbs has you know a water issue a drainage issue uh, where the where the mosquitoes are are going crazy in their cedars. So yes, um, we're reaching the last like eight minutes. Um, wow, do we have a couple more questions? We do. Ari's okay. written in. Hi, what can you do to prevent rabbits from eating the bark on my shrubs? Mm. Thank you. Um, so you can you know protect them with like tree wraps. You can build like a little structure around them. Um, they're just note that RA not sure where you are. If you get the snow, they're very light. They'll walk over the structure on the snow if it fills it up. Uh, but there's also things um, that you can find at your local garden center. Uh, Ortho Vegan Max comes to mind or Scoot that you can apply to the bark of your shrubs that as they go to bite into it or nibble on it, they get that taste and they're turned off and they'll, they'll walk mm -hmm. away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I also think of there's some perennials you can maybe plant around your shrubs that uh, bunnies don't like anything that is fragrant or furry. Mm -hmm. So if anything that has like Russian sage, cat mint, um, lamb's ear, like I'm not a fan of lamb's ear, but it's, it works, right? It could be like, a, you know, around the base of your plants. So if it's furry, has a texture to it, is fragrant, uh, they will stay away. So, um, so that's another thing where you can kind of add some new plants to your garden and it be a bit of a, a discouragement because um, I think some of those you might need to stage it right try doing some some of the fragrant and furry plants try doing the tree wrap around the base especially the fall and winter and then try something like a product like scoot yeah oh that's excellent mm -hmm. uh, oh, as I play around with that uh, our last question is uh, Shane writes in hi what shrubs look good all year long mm -hmm. uh, I have all of the weather for sorry I have all of the weather of the four seasons, including rain, snow, sleet, hail, wind, and drought. Just mm -hmm. trying uh, to spruce up my year a bit all year long. Okay. You know, one we skipped over here, it comes to mind is St. John's wort, don't you think? Mm -hmm. yeah, that's yeah. like, that's an, that's an interesting option in the sense that it has, um, you know, flowers, it's green, it's a nice compact size, but it's got a really interesting fall uh, berry and leaf, don't, don't, doesn't it? Yeah, and the leaves tend to change color as they grow in the season. You can get all sorts of different colored uh, um, berries on them. Uh, they're 
some bigger ones or some nice compact ones. So some great ones for different uh, sizes and places in your yard as well, for sure. One of the, in the garden center right now, the St. John's work that we have is looking fabulous. It's one of the mm. better colored shrubs right now. Okay, yeah. that's great. And then snowberry, which I think is blooming, even though it's, so maybe the one, because I went for a walk on a trail this past week, and there were quite a bit of white berries on a shrub. So I don't know, is that snowberry? Yeah, or is it could the, be. Because there's one that blooms, I know, and that has a berry more in the fall. Yeah, yeah, I think there's some, the snowberries out, and then some of the, uh, the dogwoods are also starting to show yes. some of their berries. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So that's another option too, is the dogwood, not necessarily flowering, but, you know, really interesting variegated foliage for most of the year. And then when there's no foliage on it, the stems are red and you can get them green and yellow. So that can be something that you put amongst the other shrubs, uh, especially in a, in a shady area um, or part sun area, right? You can do the gray, mix, mixing the red and the green and the, and the yellow twig in amongst other things, I think, um, you know, it's a great way to extend your season, right? Because you have the color exactly. in the fall when everything else is losing its leaves. You can see the interesting stems. And when they're in the middle of winter, when everything's white and covered in snow, you've got these red stems and yellow stems and green. Like it's like a, a really nice like chartreuse green almost, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so exactly. that's that's a neat way. So it's hard for one thing to do all four seasons. But I think if you could get three seasons out of it, um, then you're then you're uh, then you're you you've done a good job right because then it's overlapping yeah exactly you're staged just like everything else yeah. really in nature everyone has their time yeah. yeah so yeah so there's lots to talk about and lots to think about on uh, uh regarding native shrubs or native ours we definitely like matt said earlier opened email us questions post a question or a picture in our facebook page uh down the garden path podcast Facebook page. We'd love to help you um, when we can. And uh, yeah, so that's a great uh, resource. But consider, you know, ask at your local garden centers when you're looking, especially if you have an established garden and you're just looking for one or two things, then, you know, maybe consider uh, what what native shrub would be good in your neighborhood, in your mm. area, or even if you have, let's say you have a lot of property and you want to take up space, you know, you can't be buying all these little shrubs. You need something that is actually going to, you know, cover some geography. So that's another thing to think about some of the larger um, nanny berries and larger viburnums, right? Larger yeah. citrus berries, things that will, you know, take up space, but still provide that seasonal interest as well as food and uh, shelter and and uh, nutrition to a lot of uh, of your local na native birds and bees and and insects very well said yeah good well shout out <laughs> Woo natives Woo <laughs> yes uh yeah and that brings us to the end of the show um so thank you everybody thank you for tuning in thank you as always for joining us on uh monday evening we love getting together and talking gardening with all of you guys um, this brings the end of the month of shrubs. And so if you know, uh, we're talking about a theme every uh, new month. And next month, next week, we are going to kick off our uh, trees and upright evergreens Excellent. Uh, month. So we've got lots to talk about. Next week, we're going to talk about native trees. So we're talking about native shrubs and native bars. We're going to continue the conversation kind of. With There'll some, be a little crossover, you know, crossover. serviceberry shrubs and serviceberry trees. Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> yeah that's going to be great. Um, so yeah, and again, if you're just tuning in and you didn't catch the beginning of the show, the show will be released as a podcast as well. So we love that you're tuning in to the live episode, but if you didn't catch it all, then, you know, please search for Down the Garden Path podcast on your favorite podcast app and subscribe and you'll be notified when we get a new episode loaded. That's right. That's right. Um, so thank you everyone. Thanks again for tuning in. Thank you, Linda, Ken, Brent, Mike, Brett, sorry, Mike, uh, Spring, Peter, Cindy, Ray, Ari, and Shane for all of your questions. Thank you for joining us here. Thank you, Gary, for helping us produce this wonderful show. Uh, thanks, Joanne. Love doing this with you. Yeah, me and too. Um, tune in next week, everyone. Native trees. Native trees. And uh, thanks for joining us here down the garden path on Reality Radio 101.
Thank you for listening to Down the Garden Path with your hosts, Joanne Shaw and Matthew Dressing, right here on Reality Radio 101.